This podcast focuses on regulatory and corporate developments in highly regulated spaces. I'm Christian Bax, and I used to regulate medical marijuana. I'm Tony Glover, and I used to regulate alcoholic beverages, casino gaming, and tobacco. Now together, we're regulated. Welcome back. The Regulated Pod is very pleased to welcome local government attorney extraordinaire Jessica Iserman from Stearns Weaver. Jesse and I go way back to when we were in law school, and ever since I've known her, she's done great work. We re- re- reconnected when she worked for Leon County, and they were having to think a little bit about medical marijuana. But since then, she has gone into private practice and deals with a grand scope of local government issues. And it's the perfect subject to dive into during COVID-19 because it's impacting virtually every element of almost every local government and the country at large. And so if you don't know, most politics and most government you deal with in your daily life is local government. And so this is an extremely interesting area of law, and there's no better person to talk to than Jesse Iserman. So welcome, Jesse. How is the working from home life treating you so far? Well, thank you for having me. Working from home is great. I'm, I've been really enjoying it. And I go to the office about once a week to take care of the stuff that can't really be done you know, virtually. Tell the regulated audience, where, where in the world are you right now? Where is, where is your home and where do you work out of? So I work out of the Stearns Weaver Tampa office and I live in St. Petersburg, Florida. So I live, I'm lucky enough to live on the water in St. Pete. So I can take a 2 p.m. break and go kayaking. St. Petersburg is really one of one of the jewels, I think, of Florida. It's so underrated. People just don't appreciate how cool it is, both downtown and in a bunch of different neighborhoods that are along the water. There's so much culture there, arts, history. I really love St. Pete. As a guy who used to live in South Tampa, I wanted to live in St. Pete, but I couldn't do the commute. So <laughs> that was my part. That was my drawback. I'll tell you, Jesse, one of the funniest things about St. Pete is when you talk to people outside of Florida and you talk about specifically St. Pete, I've heard more than three or four times people ask me, isn't that the place that the Scientologists run? <laughs> 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 Which, of course, it's not. <laughs> I'm lucky enough to call St. Pete my home, like in my my hometown, too. I grew up here. I've seen it transform from being the place where you go to die to the place where all the young people want to live. So it's been a really exciting transformation. And ironically, that was all local government that made that transformation and made those infrastructure improvements and brought in businesses to build St. Pete up to what it is today. So when you talk about that and local government being a wellspring for that type of positive change, what about St. Pete's government that say, you know, compared to uh, a local government, say that's more stagnant or maybe on the decline? Like what did St. Pete do to kind of revitalize and, and help foster that growth? St. Pete, many, many years ago, decades ago, decided that on the water was always going to be public space. They were never going to allow that to get developed. So there is this great chain of parks on the water that includes dog parks, recreation facilities, and the street behind the parks has all the retail and the shops and galleries and amazing restaurants and bars. And so St. Pete has made that area friendly to businesses while also protecting the strip of land just along the water for the public. And they host public events. There's lots of festivals that bring the public out to those parks and go to explore downtown. But primarily, St. Pete has provided economic incentives to bring in businesses, bring in office space, and they really supported the arts and culture. And that has, there's a huge tourism associated with that. And with the tourism comes the tourism dollars and brings, you know, the money for the restaurants and the shops. So it's, St. Pete, I think, has done a fabulous job in pushing the city forward and making it the the art and cultures, you know, kind of mecca that it is today. What would have been some of the more significant responses you've seen from the city of St. Pete over the last couple months to deal with COVID-19 and community spread? What has happened to those public parks and, and that outdoor vibe that St. Pete has? Well, similar to all local governments, at some point, everything got closed down Mm -hmm. where you could not access. Most facilities had closed. You could use open spaces provided you maintained a six-foot distance and were not in groups of 10 or more. 
police would actually disperse groups that were larger than that. And that we've seen that in local governments all over the state. Recently, since since the governor released his phase one, local governments, including St. Pete, have opened up their parks and their beaches again, provided social distancing measures are maintained. You mentioned that a lot of things have closed down, either by virtue of the, the governor's action a month ago or specific local action in order to either by ordinance, by order, close things down. How has that impacted local government actually functioning? So, you know, interacting with people, having public hearings, what what, what have they done to kind of help the, the due process of people actually dealing with their local governments, despite the fact that everything is basically shut down and pe- it's very difficult to get people in the same room together? It's, it's very much impacted local government and our daily lives. I mean, there's the aspect of just working with government staff. Uh, you know, I represent developers in going through the development review process and our meetings with staff have to be done virtually. It makes it more complicated when you're trying to share site plans and maps. You have to figure out how to share your screen and, you know, show the area on the map or the site plan that you're concerned with with staff. So it's harder to get in contact with staff as they are working remotely or don't understand how to use the technology or just now learning how to use the technology. But I think the biggest impact is the fact that local governments aren't holding quasi-judicial public hearings, which requires certain laws to be followed to hold those hearings. And I think it can be done, but it does take a technology feat to overcome those, you know, the virtual challenges to allow members of the public and applicants to go petition the local government for rezoning. So it's, it's really drawn development to a halt because you, developers cannot get development approvals at this time. So talk to me about the psychology of, of a de- developer now in Southwest Florida. What are they thinking? Are they, are they slowing down? Have they stopped? Are they pivoting to other projects that they may have had on the back burner that are more appealing to them now? I think right now everyone is still optimistic. I think we have reason to be. We're seeing things that reopen right now. Some local governments have decided that they can't stall any longer, so they are hosting quasi-judicial virtual meetings or having them do hybrid meetings where maybe the commissioners are virtual, but they still have a physical place to allow particip- you know, members of the public to go speak, but they televise it virtually as opposed to being a fully physical meeting or a fully virtual meeting. We're seeing more of these hybrid meetings show up because governments are realizing that de- we need development. We all want to restart the economy as quick as possible. And to do that, development is a big component of the economy. So we're seeing local governments open up again. So there's some optimism there, but we saw developers in the interim, especially during the month of April, they would, you know, push a project as far as they can to public hearing and then kind of sit and wait. And if we can talk to staff, if we can talk to commissioners, we're doing that virtually to you know, advocate our position ahead of time as much as possible. What is an actual virtual meeting look like? Is that is that Zoom? Do they use some some other approach? I have seen Zoom is the, the platform I've seen used the most. Uh, there are other platforms that local governments are using. It's really up to them. There's no law mandating one platform over another. It's just whatever the local government is most comfortable with. But what I've seen is a trend where before you could be a member of the public and you just show up at the the meeting place and you can talk for your three minutes about whatever the, the item is before the local government. Now you have to register that you, you want to speak. You have to register a day in advance so that you get your virtual instructions ahead of time. And you are, you know, oftentimes the local government has, okay, at this time is when we expect you to speak. So be at your computer, be prepared to unmute. There's a lot of communication between members of the public and the IT department to make sure that the member of the public knows how to unmute and talk to their local government. It's it's definitely very involved for the IT departments. And there's certainly a reason for that, right? So I don't know if you guys have seen the story. It was on it was on one of the news aggregators I read this morning, but it was about like the South. I believe it was South African Parliament that was meeting, and they were they were they opened it up to the public with like a Zoom call, and it was just a deluge of porn. 
and just people shouting through their Zoom at the at the parliament. And so if you think about it, people do do things on the internet that they wouldn't do in real life. You have your First Amendment right to freedom of speech and the ability to petition your government. You can show up. You can basically say whatever you want within within reason at a public meeting, right? You apply that to the internet to a much broader scope of people where you can make it somewhat more anonymous because people can just give fake names or fake emails. It's very difficult to actually track these people. <laughs> you have to have some system, right? Otherwise it would just be, it would be bedlam. Would well, be I, I do terrible. have just a, a, you know, a pro tip for our friends in South Africa is um, you set up your Zoom conference call and then you stream it live on YouTube. That is no opportunity for unfortunate engagement from the public. So that's, that's maybe how I would think about it. And we have seen that with local governments all across the state. Oftentimes their meetings are streamed on Facebook or YouTube in any event. So if you do not want to speak at the public meeting, but you're interested in what happens, you can always, you don't need to register to view the meeting. You can go to YouTube or Facebook just as you could before the meeting was entirely virtual. Talk about the hybrid solution that people have come up with in order to allow for an open public meeting, but kind of allow for a physical presence as well? So I have seen, particularly Orange County has done this, where everything is virtual, except they allow the public to come speak to them in person at the county center. So they have a basically area set up with a camera and an IT person who sanitizes the area between each speaker. And they have the lobby area that is open and spaced out where you can practice your social distancing measures while waiting for your turn to speak. And in the lobby is a television and you can hear and see the meeting live as it is occurring so that you're primed and ready for when it's your time to speak on your issue. I've been to a couple local government meetings and sometimes the public comments can get a little bit spicy, a little bit out there. I think a lot of our audience is probably familiar with the, the fictional version of this in Parks and Rec, but it's not that different from what real life public comment mm-hmm. is like. <laughs> Are people a little bit more unfettered? Are they pretty much the same? How, how has the general public adapted to providing comment virtually? I think comments are more relevant than normal because the the non-relevant people who have their their pet issues have not come to, they haven't put out the effort that I've seen for virtual meetings. Uh, I'm sure that as soon as physical meetings resume, they will come back with their pet issues to speak and petition their local governments. But I haven't seen anything crazy on the virtual platform I've watched maybe at least 10 to 15 virtual public hearings and performing research for Stearns Weaver and determining what best practices are for conducting these virtual meetings. When you when you talk about somebody's pet issue, what that sparks in my mind is is Patton Oswalt from Parks and Rec, where it's this guy who like gets up and complains about Star Wars during, <laughs> during his public meetings whenever he has the chance to speak. So you have you have people who basically hang out at your local government who just raise the same issue every meeting? Is that is that kind of how it goes? Yeah, we have certain members of the public have issues where if there's anything even tangentially somehow related, they will come speak to their local government on that. An example is a development approval, you know, that requires the removal of trees. And then there's someone whose pet issue is trees and they want to save every single tree that exists today. They will come and speak and oppose every development if that development proposes removing a tree, which is almost every development it has some aspect of tree removal. You know, that's just an example. We've seen, you know, people have other very interesting pet issues. We had one guy who was really wanted funding for to research the regrowth of alligator tails. So he... <laughs> And he, he, is that a thing? Do alligator tails grow back when you I, them I don't know. Is it a problem? Do do alligators not have tails? Is that I didn't know that was a problem to <laughs> begin with. So Okay, so I want to interject here because this is game changer for me. So when I was doing my MBA, I actually very I was very interested in alligator because it's it's actually a really cool like product 
So you've got three ways to make money from alligators, right? You've got the obviously the skin, which you know you make purses or shoes or whatever out of. You've got the the Tiger King model, which is basically these people have like alligator zoos that you go and you see alligators and you like feed the alligators. And then you've got like people eat alligator. And in the southeast, it's big. You go to Massachusetts, which is where I was when I got my MBA. And I've like tried to feed people alligator because I wanted to see what people who've never eaten alligator talk about. Like nobody's ever tried alligator outside of the Southeast. It's crazy. If you are in a situation where you like alligator tail is actually a renewable resource, I'm I'm in favor. I like maybe I'm, I maybe want to get this guy's email address from you after you're done to like to talk to him. I maybe I want to do the alligator alligator tail constituency. Well, well, Tony, have you ever have you heard about that? I, I'm I'm worried, Jessica, that we've radicalized Christian now. <laughs> he's he's going to be at the next it's Leon County <laughs> Leon County it's Commission a meeting. Yeah, I do not think that was the intent of the research. <laughs> It was certainly not to to exploit that market that you have identified. Oh, it's the opposite. He was trying to protect the alligators. Exactly. <laughs> Christian's a poacher. He's a renewable poacher, I guess. I'm not, I'm not a poacher. You can eat these things, but it's like you could. I mean, it's like you know Dwight Schrute from The Office. He talks about like a his quarter horse, where he has this machine that actually lets you eat a quarter of a horse. <laughs> I just want to point out again, that this is a, a podcast where your topic right now is local government. And I think you brought up Parks and Rec three times. No, that one was The Office. That was way oh, true. That's <laughs> right, true. I mean, we we try to we try to keep it relevant. But you and I have had several just non podcast conversations, right, about how entertaining it is to actually watch local government because people are very like real, and you also get people who are very passionate about weird things that come in, and local government kind of gives them a public avenue to talk now it's also an amazing like we saw with what happened we don't need to get into it but we saw what happened in Tallahassee over the last couple years and those public meetings were kind of like a a boiling point for some of that stuff kind of coming out the other end just it's a combination of very mundane dry stuff with just unintentional hilarity sometimes well Leon County is just you know it's a place that's full of highly educated individuals, a lot of state government employees who have an understanding for how government works, far too many attorneys, if you ask, right, and retired attorneys that have time on their hand. And so you get interesting issues that come up and that are vigorously debated by the public. Uh, You know, I've attended several county commission meetings. I've attended more than I should admit of the city commission meetings. You know, I I think of issues and and Jessica may have worked on this at at the county. I don't know. Uh, you know, there are 20,000 feral cats in Tallahassee, apparently. And that was a very substantial issue. I know at the Leon County Commission for a time. And I have to imagine just knowing my fellow residents like I do, that there was pretty vigorous public engagement on that matter. So you just never know what will come up. And sometimes the issues are very serious. Whoa. Sometimes they are. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We have 20,000 feral cats in Leon County. Is that, Jesse, is this true? I believe so. What What are we doing about our 20,000 feral cats? Where, where do these things all live? There are communities and there are people who support those failed cat communities by bringing food. Communities of cats or community of people? Communities of cats. <laughs> are you kidding me? No, it's all, it's a subculture, essentially. There's these people who want to support cats. Leon County does participate in like a trap and release program where they catch the failed cats and spay them or neuter them and release them back into the wild. So to kind of stop the growth of the failed cats, they, they don't want to kill them. They just want to stop the growth. Uh, 20,000 <laughs> 20, feral cats is like a college basketball stadium full of feral cats. Like that's an amazing Cute little amount cats. of feral cats. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned the basketball stadium because probably about, about half of them live across the street from there, across games in that wooded thicket. <laughs> oh, is that where they all live? I, I know that from from being a former All Saints resident. We have our fair share in that in that neighborhood. And I do believe there was a citizen who spoke about the development, the Washington Square development in downtown Tallahassee, whose concern was primarily that that vacant lot was home to several feral cats. And that citizen was concerned about where those cats were going to go once construction started. Jesse, what are your favorite moments from public testimonies, just as far as issues or or points that have been made from your years working with local governments? I think the 
the citizen I mentioned about the alligator tails, that's always been a, that memory of him coming. He came a handful of times to county commission. And he, to give you a visual, he is a homeless individual and brought a, you recall those science experiment boards when you were a kid, those big like three panel boards that you would open up. He brought one of those that was covered in papers and very tiny writing and opened it to present it to the commission. And one of the commissioners was like, I can't read that. Like, oh. And he spoke for his three minutes about wanting funding for the alligators. And then he said that he had practiced his research on himself by cutting off his fingers and regrowing his fingers. And he was missing a couple of fingers. Was it obvious or did he like take off a glove and be like, look, <laughs> look at my well, fingers? You don't regularly look at someone's hands. So no one looked at, you know, his hands. He wasn't wearing any gloves or anything. But then, you know, when he says that, you look at his hands and you realize he's missing about three fingers on one hand. So you're concerned about his mental health at that point. And I believe he ended up, he also went to the city of Tallahassee, a commission meeting with the city of Tallahassee and, and gave the same presentation and I believe he was evaluated at that point for his mental health. Oh, my gosh. So his point, because we've established his point was not that alligators' tails grow back. It's that alligators' tails don't grow back. So was his point like, look, I cut my fingers off and they didn't grow back just like an alligator tail? No, he, I believe he thought his fingers had grown oh, back. Oh, okay. All right. And, and really, who, who who am I to say that they didn't? I don't know. <laughs> so moving away from the, the raging alligator tail debate back into our COVID response. One of the un- other interesting things that Stearns Weaver touched on that I, that I saw in the webinar was dealing with sunshine requirements and some of the, the actual group public meeting requirements of the of the body itself. When you can't really, it's very difficult to physically get these guys and women in the same room who are, you know, elected officials. How how are they functionally doing this? Do they each individually just kind of step into these virtual meetings together? Right. So if you are having an entirely virtual meeting, the commissioners each have their own Zoom. So they're in their respective homes or offices, and you see a screen of, you know, seven commissioners. And as they talk, you know, some, it depends on how the local government has it set up with the live view. If they could have it in speaker view where whoever talks just pops up, or you can see all of them at once. And sometimes they'll, they'll have their clerk also on, they'll have their, you know, city or county attorney on and their county administrator. So you'll see a box of 16 people or a window of, you know, 16 different people in their different locations. So it's entirely virtual. So it's, it's like, you know, your company Zoom meeting, but broadcast to the world on YouTube so the public can view it. And technically, how have those things gone? Because a lot of local governments, they, they tend to be oh, on, a, on a higher age range than like the median population, right? And that, that particular group tends to sometimes struggle with technology. So how have they reacted to a very tech-heavy way of doing business? It was definitely tough initially. We saw, I was on one meeting that was before the local government got a video. They did meetings entirely by telephone. um, And this was an emergency policy group meeting. And someone had put the phone on hold, but there was hold music that was playing. So the meeting could not continue because there was hold music that was playing. And they were trying to figure out whose phone that was so that they could cut them off. And when you have 50 people on the phone for this meeting, because you have the elected officials and you have the support staff that go with all those officials and whatever questions come up, they, they need staff available to answer them. They could not figure out whose it was. Eventually, it was maybe 10 minutes. Eventually, the person came back or they figured out the phone and cut it off. But initially, there were a lot of issues. Since then, I've seen a big learning curve and you know, the elected officials know how to unmute themselves to talk or to vote, and they know not to leave their computer because we've had situations where someone would make a motion and then the elected official would think, 
oh, well, that's the motions made and I'm going to walk away. Like, no, you have to vote on them. Now that the motions were made, God, we need you to make the vote now. So the staff member would have to call that official and say, hey, no, go back to your computer. You're not, your work's not done yet. So it's, it's been interesting. It definitely makes meetings longer because you have that one person who doesn't understand you know, either a staff member who doesn't know how to share their screen or a elected official who doesn't know how to unmute. So everything kind of comes to a stop until they figure it out. And you kind of see IT working with them right there. You hear the IT person say, OK, now press this button, now press that button. And it's, it's all out there for the public to view and see. But they're trying to work through it. I think a lot of learning has happened. And I think that it's it's something that we should maintain this technology ability because in Florida we have that unique perspective of hurricanes and we may need virtual meetings again in the future. So I think it's an important skill that local governments should maintain even after the COVID crisis is over. I mean, and there's an ADA and a, and a resource issue too for, you know, it's easier for, for many constituents to just pull something up and uh, as a, a public meeting stream on their phone or on their computer, right? Rather than actually going down to where the meeting is actually happening, right? So there's practical reasons why you would have this thing occur digitally, even when the, the bodies are back together physically. I, I agree. I think it that local governments, if they take anything away from this, it's that maybe virtual comments are possible and perhaps allow them so that if you have a physical meeting on an issue, you're not allowing someone to call in to provide their comments. The person has to find child care, transport to the meeting, find parking. It's usually in a you know downtown area and then sit and wait for two hours for their issue to come up for them to speak. So if you know, a local government allows virtual participation by members of the public, they will certainly get more participation from the public. So we've seen from a state government perspective, you know, we've seen policymakers respond to the crisis by being more accommodating, you know, both by relaxing regulations and then also relaxing some of those logistical matters you talked about, accepting digital site plans instead of physical site plans, et cetera. From your perspective as a local government attorney, do you think local governments are doing enough in this regard in terms of being accommodating? And also, do you think that some of these reforms, like doing Zoom meetings, allowing digital submissions, both of comments and of applications. Do you think that's something that's going to stick into the future, even after we beat this virus and have a vaccine? In place? I think absolutely certain aspects are going to stick into the future. Perhaps you know, submission of plans digitally is something that's easy and convenient and local governments may have realized that it's something that they can accommodate and maybe even be more efficient at, at this point. There are other Things I think you had mentioned, you know, some local governments and how they're adapting. I think some local governments are adapting well and moving forward with their virtual meetings. Other local governments seem paralyzed by the COVID crisis and they are resisting holding virtual meetings, either maintain, by maintaining physical meetings, or just imposing social distancing measures, but you're still asking members of the public to enter a public space that they normally wouldn't if they want to make comments physically. Of course, they're accepting comments by email, which has always been the case by email or written letters is always an option. But it's not the same when you can go and look your elected officials in the eye and say, I disagree or I strongly agree with whatever is being proposed. But the local governments that have refused to hold quasi-judicial meetings in any capacity, physically or virtually, they're not showing any desire to accommodate. And that's what we need to see. We, we being the public, we need to see government's ability to adapt to these changes and find a way forward because we think it exists. Well, if, if I were a tech company operator or if I was a lobbyist representing a small tech company with this capability, I mean, I can't think of a better time to try to sell into local governments, identifying those groups that really are struggling and are reluctant to move forward with Zoom meetings and things of that nature in providing some sort of custom built solution or even just technical assistance for this. So from a from a attorney lobbyist perspective, I think this really is a heck of an opportunity to, to generate some government contracts and generate some work for your clients. Absolutely. I just received a, a targeted ad, I'm sure, 
from a company whose their specialty is hosting phone town hall meetings. I didn't even know that company existed. But it makes sense if you have a development that requires some sort of community meeting in addition to a public hearing. How do you get members of the community together to talk about and answer questions on a project? And a phone town hall is a really great idea to bring that community together, invite them to this town hall where they can call in from their homes and they can ask all their questions they want about whatever the proposed development is. What recourse do citizens have when their local government just basically refuses to hold public meetings? Well, it depends what type of issue you're trying to bring forward with focusing on the quasi-judicial land use approvals. There is a state statute that requires local governments to make a decision on a development application within a certain time frame. But that statute doesn't go on to say what happens if they don't make that decision. So essentially, it creates a cause of action for a developer to bring in court to force a local government to hear the issue. But of course, courts are partially closed at this point, and or things are moving very slowly in courts. And courts, even in a normal situation, lawsuits run very slowly. So if you're trying to get something approved, you got to kind of weigh... Do you want to pursue a lawsuit under that state statute that forces governments to make a decision? But by the time the court makes a decision, we're going to be back to normal and you're going to kind of hurt your reputation with your your relationship with that local government by bringing that lawsuit or just being patient and trying to work with the local government and say, what can we do that would make you feel comfortable holding this meeting? And we have seen some local governments allow you know, these hearings to move forward if a waiver is provided. So one of the hardest aspects of quasi-judicial meetings is cross-examination. And we've seen Pasco County say, okay, applicants, you can move forward if you waive your right to cross-examination. So an applicant can make a decision and weigh their risks and their options of holding their application or moving forward, but moving forward means they waive certain rights. Well, this has been a recurring theme on this podcast over the past 60 days or so since the coronavirus really hit in earnest is litigation. We've been every to every topic we've brought up, we've sort of contemplated the chance of litigation. A few weeks ago, we talked about EPA relaxing certain pollution rules. And since we recorded that podcast, there's already been a number of lawsuits filed challenging that. And so it strikes me, and I can think of some specific examples here in Florida that I will not bring up. But it strikes me that for every rule that's relaxed to provide an accommodation, there could be a group that's either affected directly or indirectly, like they just don't like it, that may file a lawsuit. So, I mean, I think we could be dealing with years of unpromulgated rulemaking, sunshine law, um, or other sort of you know procedural type litigation objections coming from advocacy groups and, and other companies. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Now, I know in the dynamic of developers, it's a very competitive, very competitive industry, and it's an industry that's not afraid to go to court. So I'm sure you're going to see some of that in, in your practice as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Can I throw out a kind of a spicy take from just watching how this has unfolded at local governments and this public hearing thing, right? So I, I think we'd all agree that there's some very beneficial things that happen from uh, an egalitarian model where you allow the public to interface with their local government virtually, right? I think a lot of people think this, but I'm going to say this, that I think that there are a lot of local governments that don't want that, don't want an effective, efficient system for citizens to be able to actually participate because the meetings as they as they happen now, right? If you look at the population of the community as a whole, participation is very low for what how local governments actually interface on day-to-day issues. If you have at most, you know, 25 people who show up for like a very important thing in the community. If you expanded that to like 250 people, the whole public comment structure would collapse. It would be completely untenable and unworkable. And so this itself, if you had a common adoption of a virtual public meeting model that was actually used by citizens in their community, it would completely alter the fundamental way that local governments do business and take public comment. Because it, it, the current model could not handle that type of volume. You would never get any issue done. 
That's true. It would make meetings very, very lengthy. Uh, already, most local governments have a three-minute rule for public participation because of the number of members of public that want to come speak, and they want to be able to hear all of those speakers during the meeting, so they have to limit their time to three minutes. I can't imagine if you have you know, 250 people who actually want to speak and they don't designate, you know, a, um, a spokesperson to speak on their one issue for all of them, then you're going to have to limit them to what, two minutes, one minute? At what point does it become yeah. reasonable or unreasonable? You look at just how the Florida legislature handles it. The Florida Senate and the Florida House deal on momentous, ground-shaking stuff every session, and people show up to comment. And the way it functionally works, because they can't comment once these bills have hit the floor. So when the bills are in committee meetings, that's when the public gets to comment. But, I mean, we saw this with medical marijuana. You'll have 60 people show up who all write comment cards, and you get to... 14 of them. And they all get to speak for 30 seconds, basically. And anyone who very clearly didn't drive from out of outside of Tallahassee, if you're just like a lobbyist and you you care a lot, the committee chair just looks at you and says, wave in support or wave in opposition. And that's all you get to say, right? We see right now there is a model that allows for public comment on big issues where like people will commute and that doesn't work. Maybe, maybe it, it forces it to shift to maybe like a video message or, you know, almost like a, like a voicemail bank where people can like orally leave their comments after showing up, the thing ends and they're like, sorry, we didn't get to you. You can still leave your public comment on the, on your zoom. And it just kind of collates it and stores it because one of, one of the things when you challenge government action where public comments are, are taken is they, they have to actually consider those public comments. You have to act, you can't just put them in the circular filing cabinet, right? And throw them out with the garbage. You have to actually listen. So there has to be a functional tool to do that. What do you think about that? Right. I mean, if public comment reaches a point where it's untenable because the meetings go so long, I could see local governments holding, you know, a couple of meetings a month just to receive public comment on the issues that they're going to consider that month and then consider those issues separate from the public comment. There is no law that says that you have to allow public comment at the same meeting where the vote is actually being That's taken and the discussion is occurring. So you can allow public comment first and have a whole meeting and six hours dedicated to, I'm going to receive public comment on this issue. And then the next day or later on, you actually consider the discussion that the local government will have their discussion and have their vote on whatever that issue is. Having heard and been aware of and educated by the members of the public and during their speaking time. What was the public comment like when you were dealing with the 5G issues in Leon County? The only public comments we received were from lobbyists. Okay, so you, you, you didn't have people who were like, we're going to light this thing on fire once you build the 5G tower in Tallahassee. Well, we had the benefit of no COVID crisis or conspiracy theories related to 5G. And at the point when Leon County adopted their 5G ordinance, I don't think most of the public knew what it was and what it meant. So, so tell, the, tell the audience a little bit about what your involvement was when 5G kind of came to Tallahassee and Leon County. 5G is the deployment of these small cell facilities. And these facilities are so small, you can actually put them on existing telephone poles. It's called densification. So where you normally have one big pole that is 120 feet tall, it covers an area of about three miles. This 5G changes that. And instead of having one big pole, you have a bunch of really small antennas that can be deployed on existing infrastructure. And they can rapidly, they can hold a lot more people at once. So for example, if you're in a football stadium and you're trying to get internet, you can't get internet because everyone is on the same cell tower. These small cells can cycle more people, so you can have more people on the internet at once on one tower. But they have a very small range. The range is only about 1,000 feet as opposed to three miles. So you have to have densify them. So every 1,000 feet, you need another antenna. So they are being deployed in the right way because that's where the infrastructure is to place these small cell facilities. And also the self-driving cars need internet access. And so if these are placed in the right of way, the self-driving cars will have that access 
as they drive down that major roadway to all those towers or what really small cell facilities. So Leon County led the way in drafting an ordinance that would allow these small cell facilities in the rights of way, but with some design standards so that it wasn't a, a mess look. You know, we had the standards relating to color of the antenna, size of the antenna, and material of the supporting structure to match the material of the surrounding area so that it didn't look out of place. And there is a small cell facility in Tallahassee in downtown that I bet most people have no idea what it is. It's just a black pole. Hmm. And and just with respect to the conspiracy, because I understand that some of our listeners may be living happy lives and they're not being inundated with Facebook posts from their high school friends about 5G conspiracies and the pandemic and, and all the other YouTube kooky, kookiness that's out there. There's a conspiracy theory that 5G cell phones and 5G cell facilities have somehow caused the COVID-19 pandemic. And <laughs> and I, I don't think we need to address that from a scientific standpoint, but I guess I do want to get your perspective on that, Jessica. Do you, <laughs> do you feel any way responsible for the coronavirus based on your work on the 5G, <laughs> on the 5G in Leon County? <laughs> I, I do not feel responsible. I I think there's definitely a correlation because, you know, small cell companies or the Verizon's AT&Ts of the world deployed 5G and of course, large urban centers first, because that's where it's needed. And that's where the population is. But in that, of course, when you have dense population and there's an outbreak, that's where the outbreak is. That's the hotspot. So I see the correlation, but that's all it is, is a correlation. There's no causation. There's a great meme on Twitter, and it's a picture from the 1918 pandemic, and somebody's photoshopped a cell tower in the background. (laughs) (laughs) And I just just enjoyed that (laughs) bit of humor. Just to piggyback, finally, to to add the period at the end of the sentence to what, what Tony brought up. The conspiracy theorists have taken a step farther. So, So not only are they making Facebook posts, a small number of some of these people are literally going out to their communities, finding these 5G towers and lighting them on fire <laughs> and destroying them. I didn't, I didn't understand the densification. So when I read like 50 towers have been destroyed or 50 cells have been destroyed in, I guess, whatever, 4G and lower, that's a big deal. But if you're talking about every thousand feet, that's a little bit less of an impact. That's still a lot. I mean, to have 50 cells completely destroyed and lit on fire. It's still a lot. It's an expensive technology. And, you know, someone deployed that to a part of a town that now doesn't have the 5G capabilities because those small cells were destroyed. Well, Jessica, in closing, is there anything else you think we should talk about with respect to local governments and their response to coronavirus? I think it's important to note that the governor's order, which allows these virtual meetings, at some point is going to expire. And meetings will go back to being physical, but hopefully with an added benefit of now the knowledge of using virtual capabilities to engage the public more and ensure that every voice is heard that wants to be heard. Right. And and also when I think about the expiration of executive orders, I think about how much money lobbyists are going to make next special, you know, next legislative session advocating for some of these permanent legislative changes. So I, I you know, I fully expect the Florida Association of Counties to be fully engaged on this issue and a number of contract lobbyists. I think it's going to be a very interesting time for us in Tallahassee trying to determine which of these changes need to be legislatively enacted after expiration of the executive order. So it will be fun. One last thing, Jessica, we typically ask our guests if they have a shout out to give, and that can be anything you want. It can be to a a friend, a colleague. It can be to somebody you think is doing important work. It can be a piece of content that you're watching that's helping you pass the time. It's the player's choice. Well, during these times, I'd like to give a shout out to all of our frontline first responders and nurses, doctors, you know, People, the CNAs working in long-term care facilities that are especially hit hard by these. I'd like to give a shout out to them and and let them know that I am very appreciative for all their efforts and their hard work over these past few months, especially with basically no end in sight right now. 
And and also, Jessica, how do we get in contact with you at your law firm? You can reach me by going to the Stearns Weaver Miller website. All of my contact information is available there. And just one last note, I'd like to point out that Stearns Weaver will be hosting another webinar, kind of a part two webinar to the one we did on April 22nd, that will summarize what we have seen local governments do with virtual meetings and the best practices we've seen evolve from that. And we'll make sure that we share those uh, press releases and announcements via social media. You can follow us on Twitter at RegulatedPod. You can send us emails, complaints, comments, tips, secret polling data, regulatedpod at gmail.com. I figure if I ask for secret polling data enough, somebody will send me the cross tabs. I'm just waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jessica, so much for being on the pod. And Christian, do you want to take us out? Also, thank you, Jessica. Very much appreciated. As always, ladies and gentlemen, stay compliant. <laughs>